Hey guys, welcome back to Gen Meme. On the podcast this week, we talk about work and what happens when a global black swan slash black mirror event interrupts the global economy and dramatically changes how we try to make ends meet every day. We're seeing some positive developments on the public health front. The number of new COVID cases here in Malaysia have stabilized and we can slowly start going back to our new normal routines, like going back to the gym, or for me, bringing all my props to the yoga studio with plenty of sanitizer and socially distanced masks. We're still adjusting to these SOPs, even as more sectors of the economy are reopening. But it looks like it's going to be a tough road ahead for many. The global economy is highly interconnected, with high degrees of interaction and cooperation between countries. As more advanced economies struggle with getting people back on their feet financially, smaller and highly open economies that are part of the global value chain like Malaysia will likely be adversely impacted as well. We can see this in how salaries are being cut, people are being laid off, and lots of small businesses are having to roll down their shutters for good. Some sectors of the economy have been more vulnerable than others, but no industry is safe. Even if you've been lucky enough to have held on to your job, there's a very real risk that the months to come will see more jobs being shared and businesses having to radically change how they operate to adapt to this economic aftershock. Yeah, there's a lot of economic anxiety in the air and speaking from some experience, it's not an easy feeling to hold. A huge part of why we're making this podcast is so we can think through these big issues to help each other figure things out. We reach out to experts to help out with this, but we also listen to our friends, peers, mentors, and so many of us currently caught in the crosshairs of this crisis. But before we get to the bird's eye view, let's hear from those who are going through it on the ground. So uh, originally, I started work in Singapore. I was an engineer there in the oil and gas industry. And in 2014, uh, you know, they got another price war between the Arabs and the US at the time. And I worked for an American company, so I got laid off. So 2014, and I joined another oil and gas company, and within six months, they lay me off again, and then that's when I give up. So I returned back to Malaysia. I, I wrote an article about how I got laid off, um, and uh, I started my Airbnb business, So, which is the place that you're seeing here. Um, it started from one unit, and then I managed all the way up to 10. Uh, it was me, and I had two uh, housekeeper to help me out. So uh, business was already kind of declined on 2019, but during 2020, during the COVID thing, and that, that was just the final nail in the coffin. And I don't see uh, tourism or anything that relates to events uh, going to recover anytime soon, especially this year. I, I doubt that live events, forget about it this year, you know? So that's why I decided to just pull the plug. I got my money back from the deposit and all that. So it's not too bad for me. But uh, yeah, it's still the, it is the end of uh, my Airbnb venture after five years. I did manage to get a bit of uh, a stimulus during uh, the first few months of PKP. It wasn't a lot. I, I don't think it really helps out, quite frankly, because my business already closed down. It, I don't think it will help out the business, but it would help out me to buy groceries. Yes, everything is very risky, right? I am, am weighing in my options. Should I get a job? Should I start a business? So I'm, I'm looking at both of these at the moment. So in terms of jobs, I was a former engineer. And I don't think I want to be an engineer. I don't think it's my thing. I mean, if I knew earlier, I wouldn't even be an engineer. But, you know, typical Asian parents. So when I was stuck during PKP, I wanted to start another business, but I didn't know what. Right? But then being stuck in my room for like, three, what, three months, four months, something like that, I was bored out of my mind. I didn't know what to do. So I had this website for my old Airbnb business that is used to get direct bookings, you know? And uh, I repurposed that into a blog, so which is the blog right now. And I just like to talk about personal finance. And that's how it started. And then, uh, it, you know, some, after a while, apparently some people like my writing. And I thought, oh, maybe I could be a writer. So these are the job that I was looking for, is either a uh, content marketer, digital marketer, something along those lines. And um, the highest job that I could get before PKP was 5,000 ringgit. And that was a technical writer. So you're a writer, but you write really technical stuff. So as an as a as engineering background, it really suits me. I, I don't think a lot of people can handle it, it's too technical. 
but I turned it down at the time because I thought it would get better. <laughs> mm. Little did we know the whole world crumbled. So what happens when work is interrupted? Recently, the Malaysian Department of Statistics announced that the April 2020 unemployment rate had spiked to 5%, the highest it's been in 30 years. This brings the total number of unemployed persons to 2.4 million for the first four months of 2020, an almost 50% increase from the previous year. The Department of Statistics survey also notes that another 2.6 million people were operating their own businesses or self-employed. These are your pasar traders, caterers, smallholders, and all kinds of registered freelancers. They were very badly impacted during the MCO months when they couldn't run their trades and businesses. 5% sounds low compared to, say, the US, where the unemployment rate has skyrocketed to 13.3% as of May 2020, with more than 45 million people filing for unemployment claims over the past three months. However, many argue that the actual figure may be closer to 16%. There seems to be a perception gap between what we're hearing on the ground and how unemployment is actually being captured by official statistics. Dr. Economics Analyst Hafiz Noshan from the Zoom did help explain how these stats work, what they say, and figure out whether we'll all get out of 2020 in one piece. You're the technical person here. You're the expert. Well, how can, can you just sort of like give us some understanding of what is meant by things like the official unemployment rate? Like how, how, how do they determine it? What does it mean? Why does it sometimes feel a bit off? You know, do you know, you know what I mean? Because I mean, you speak to people and they have one story and then you look at what's coming out in the newspapers and it's a very nice small number, you know, like 3.4%, 3.5%. Does it offer a complete picture of, our, of the state of our workforce? So the employment rate in general, what it says really, it's just a, a portion of people who are unemployed and looking for jobs over the workforce, which is the workforce is basically a uh, sum of uh, people who have jobs and people are looking for jobs but don't have jobs. This is, a, this is a very important distinction to have. When they think about unemployment, they, they talk about people that don't have jobs, but are looking for jobs, not just people that don't have jobs. Because this goes back to the idea of a workforce. A workforce of people, people are people that are, that are the population that is available to do work. Because in a population, there are people that exist but don't work and they, they don't need to work. Just for instance, uh, students, uh, the reti some retirees, as well as a bunch of people that are in school. So if you think about the labor force, uh, officially it counts people that age be from 15 to 64 in Malaysia. And that's not the full story. They also discount people that in university who are not working because they are full-time student. They, even the armed forces are not included in the uh, labor force in the unemployment calculation. How unemployment rate is, is, is determined is that it's essentially a survey a survey conducted by the Department of Statistics. So the survey is, is generally representative. Uh, you are un, we just cannot don't have the resources don't have the resource at the moment to do proper census every month, right? So they do the survey. So they are pretty. Uh, I think it's pretty reliable. And, and the thing is, sometimes you look at the result, it's 3.3%, 3.2%. So in April, it was 3.9%, which is the highest in the longest time. This might sound like a small number, but it's actually quite, quite big. Uh, if you think about it, uh, if you're not mistaken, 3.3%, that's about 200,000 200, people, not, not uh, 200,000 or 300,000, I can't remember the exact number, not having work, but looking for jobs, right? Because if you drill down on this on these figures, it, it's also a lot of caveats. For instance, to be a, to be considered as fully employed, you need to be working for at least an hour in a week. So if you work just an hour in a week, you're considered employed. So there's a, there's a philosophical debate about it. Essentially, the reason they did, they did that is not so much they think people are full time. They, not, it's not the fact that they think. The dissertation think that if you work just an hour, uh, you consider working full time. Not what what they're trying to measure is really people that have total lack of work. This does does not mean that uh, dissertation 
do not recognize that there is a thing as underemployment. There is an underemployment. They, they do recognize it. But the thing is, in Malaysia, they don't really report that uh, quite well. Is there a generally, um, you know, like an international standards of sorts when we talk about underemployment? Is there like a benchmark? There is, but it's a bit complicated. I mean, there, there are three versions I'm mistaken, but the, I think the most popular one is really, because in the survey, you, you could be asked uh, how, how many hours do you work in a week? And then they also ask how many hours in a week that you want to work more, right? So if they say that if, you're, if, you, if the number of hours they want to work more is more than their num actual number of work of hours, that means they are willing to work more, that means they are underemployed. That's one way of defining it. It's a mix of both what you can feasibly collect and uh, collate, rather, and also just sort of like how one would define uh, statistics. Um, but then, I mean, uh, I believe there's a forecast that, you know, our rate of unemployment is going to grow quite substantially uh, by by the end of the year, um, I'm, I have a number in my head, but I'm not 100% sure whether that's the right number. So, like, um, is, how, how, how is the government dealing with this issue right now? So, I think the government is following a pretty, a pretty what well, seems to be attempted right now, which we've seen everywhere else. Um, is, is taking the right step in general in terms of just the direction. Um, so there are essentially two major policies when it comes to addressing rising unemployment in this particular moment of time. One is with subsidies, which is essentially a, what you call a job retention program. Uh, what it means is that in time of crisis, companies suddenly don't have the cash to keep employing people. So rather than let these companies uh, fire their workforce, their labor, uh, their workers, uh, instead of that, then the government comes in and subsidizes some portion or, or a large portion of those uh, wages. So in, so in the sense that the company don't have to fire the job, fire, fire the workers. So this, um, this assumes that in the, in the future, somehow in the future, the companies would need those uh, workers again. But that, that, that's actually one step, one, one measure, uh, job subsidies. The other one is really to partially subsidize workers that have been laid off, not temporarily laid off, I mean, put on uh, unpaid leave. So right. the government don't, don't pay these people, but the government pays them instead. So those are essentially two steps. It might be others, but these two, two measures seem to be the most popular. Uh, in the past couple of months. Um, but the problem is, it's not the, just the direction that you need to think about, it's also the magnitude of those, uh, the magnitude of those measures. And for Malaysia, it seems that the size of wage subsidy, especially, uh, should, I mean, it, it could be much higher. Yeah, of course, they are considered like common finance or whatever, but given the time of crisis, it, it, does, it does seem that uh, we need more in terms of which subsidies, especially at the beginning, beginning. Through three stimulus packages, the Malaysian government has introduced measures to help Malaysians keep their jobs and assist those who have found themselves without an income. Here, we'll focus on the two most recent ones, Prihatin and Penjana, which was announced after the MCO came into effect. So, let's break it down. The first, Prihatin, was announced on March 27, two weeks into the MCO. Under Prihatin, eligible households will receive up to 1,000 ringgit payment. The government will pay wage subsidies of 600 ringgit per month for three months for workers earning less than 4,000 ringgit. And an allocation of 9.5 billion ringgit was pledged to help finance SMEs. The second, Penjana, was announced a few months later on June 5th as the impact of the coronavirus became more apparent. Under Penjana, wage subsidies with 600 ringgit for each employee for an additional three months were introduced. Hiring incentives of up to 800 ringgit per month for six months for employers and allowance of 1,000 ringgit for six months. 
2 billion ringgit allocated for training and reskilling programs in collaboration with local industries, technical and digitization grants for SMEs, and SME funding and microcredit at concession rates. Is it time for more radical measures? Um, what's your take on some of the big moves um, uh, people are thinking about um, to kickstart the economy? For example, much um, um, sort of a massive reskilling through some kind of like a sort of um, workforce reduction program. You know, you're sending people back to university, TVET reskilling, all of that kind of stuff. You know, vocational training, um, and also, but not like. On the flip side, like how wise would it be to take that chunk of people out of the active labor market in order for you to do this? Like, how do you sustain that? Will you need some kind of, you know, a universal basic income kind of structure to support that um, as we go? I think um, it's a massive opportunity um, to kind of reshape the labor market uh, towards um, a form that could be more sustainable. Um, and sort of really change the way our economy works. But for that transition period, like how would that work? How would it look like? The reason why we need a radical policy is just really a crisis that we have at hand, which is, un, which is never been explained before. At the same time, the slower your response towards the crisis, the more radical the solution should be because you're losing time, right? For, for Malaysia, our the policy that we deploy, it, uh, it's not only that they seems to be insufficient, it's also deployed very late. Uh, it's due to political issues. So yes, in short, we do need some kind of radical policy. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of radical policy out there. One, one of them is really the imposition of, really the introduction of universal basic income. This is essentially to ensure everybody in, in Malaysia have some kind of basic uh, welfare, but basic level of welfare that is not, you know, that they can afford food, uh, they can, can afford nutrition, all that stuff, can, can, have, can have money to pay for rents and stuff. So this is one thing that needs to be considered. I mean, we do have some kind of municipality income, but rather in a very, what I call that, unsystematic way, which is, is, is the cash transfer that we've been having for the past couple of years. Uh, those could be improved, and could be made more systematic, and 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 that would lead to a university basic income in some ways. We are probably moving beyond the stage of beyond the stage that requires a huge uh, wage subsidy. We do need it, but it seems to be too late because employment rate is rising, and and probably will rise further to much much higher level. So one of the thing that we may require, I mean, one of the radical policies really to, you know, depending on which school you are in, is really to expand temporarily or permanently the role of government. Um, basically in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, in terms of other services. My favorite is really education and health services, right? So in health services, for instance, you may need to expand your hospitals, uh, services, and all those stuff. Employ more people, employ more nurses. And we do have a lot of nurses that are unemployed and this could be included. They are trading issues. But the point is we do need more people. Uh, and then in universities as well, this is literally a chance of us to expand educational services. Because right now, um, because if you think about it, uh, the unemployment rate, if you just, just going in general terms, the unemployment is really the number of unemployed people over the labor force, right? So one of the radical, one of the ways to reduce the employment rate is it might be playing with the math, but it's actually a real thing on the ground is to reduce the labor force temporarily. And one, one, one of my favorite is really to get people back into universities. There's still a lot of people that may want to uh, for the education, in, especially for a bachelor, for mature student, as well as for some kind of uh, master degree, right? So if, if we can expand education of, uh, capacity among our public universities and employ more people, more like that lab technician, more teaching assistants, possibly even lecturers, uh, and we may have some kind of opportunity to reduce the growth of the labor market and reduce stress in the labor market. 
because at the same, because you have to remember one of the reasons, I mean, I mean, I think when you reduce the labor market, you, you in the on, in background, you're thinking about bargaining power in the labor market because if in a crisis, there's uh, not so much job, but there's a lot of workers. So employers in this situation would have a huge bargaining power in terms of wages. So you think about it in a the crisis, there is um, weak growth, uh, wage growth pressure, which is not good for workers. It's not also not good for Malaysia if you think about uh, raising our income level, right? So to take that bargaining power out, you take the labor force out temporarily. Um, and you, when you take them out, you want to put them into good use. And one of the ways to put them into good use is really get them to, in, 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 in current part, to reskill themselves or upskill themselves, so to speak. There are the others, you know, more radical, more radical efforts. For instance, there is something that is called job guarantees, where the government just, you know, ensure everybody has jobs, some kind of job in the, in the government, in the public sector. And once the crisis is, once crisis subsides, then you can reduce the number of jobs in the public sector, that kind of stuff. So, so talking about job guarantees, there are ways to do this, right? It doesn't have to be a concrete job guarantees. One of the ways is apart from the expansion of public services in, in education and as well in health, not the way it's just public, public work. Um, or rather, you know, you already have the MRT3 happening or rather MRT2 currently being built or ECRL. You know, these are controversial projects, but the thing is this can be turn into a, some kind of job guarantee scheme for unemployed people that needs a job. So this is a, it's not a radical measure that can be taken. It requires money from government. Government have to be prepared to raise the level of their fiscal deficit relative to the GDP. But in time of crisis, uh, there is such thing as counter fiscal policy. In time of crisis, uh, especially in the, the private market, seems to be unable to react properly, unable to react fast, unable to ensure some kind of minimum standard of welfare among population. The government, unfortunately, have to step in. Conventional measures have been less effective at protecting livelihoods and making sure that no one is left behind. They also don't address quality of life concerns and long-term efforts to build a sustainable economy. Let's run through some possible tools we could use to fix the economy. Universal Basic Income, or UBI. The idea is to give every citizen, regardless of means, a guaranteed sum of money regularly and for life. Usually, enough to cover basic necessities like food, healthcare and accommodation costs. In practice, this would be different to welfare payments based on socio-economic eligibility. Workforce Reduction Schemes. These can function to temporarily reduce the number of people in the workforce, so workers could theoretically be in a stronger bargaining position to demand better wages. One way this could be done is by encouraging enrolment in higher education and reskilling programs while paying out some kind of livable stipend. Jobs Guarantee Program. Governments can also be the employer of last resort by ensuring that anyone who wants a job gets a job by carrying out public work projects and expanding services. However, there are also mechanisms that could actually work against the protection of incomes of workers, such as automation and digital transformation programs. These can actually accelerate job losses as companies try to cut labour costs to protect their businesses. It's a bit of a clusterfuck, but in times of crisis, call for quick, bold actions to avoid deepening the economic slump. We can see these moves as investments towards growing the economy towards a fairer and more sustainable model that can hopefully withstand future crises. So, what radical measures could we implement in Malaysia? So, the new economy, um, what's it going to look like? How can we solve problems big and small? You know, like, how do we solve all these kind of, like, individual issues, big structural issues, jobs, tech, education, sustainable models. I mean, it all seems a bit like it seems so, it, it seems like such a big problem to solve. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's definitely a big problem. And I don't think a single, one single policy is able to solve all of, all of these issues all at once. I mean, there needs to be a mindset shift almost, you know, governments have to be prepared to take the necessary measures when these are the things that 
under normal circumstances, you don't normally think about because uh, for whatever reason, it may mean that you get downgraded in terms of your credit ratings and so on and so forth. Because we've been taught for a long time that borrowing is bad for an economy, but at times like this, can you afford not to borrow? Yeah, I mean, like we just have to look at what's happened in, let's say, the past 70 years, right? Like, um, after World War II, there was the birth of the welfare state in Europe and um, the grand post-colonial project in the global south, you know, and that kind of like brought along a lot of positive development, but also as the world globalized, uh, we saw the birth of neoliberalization um, and the financialization um, that happened in the 90s. And after the 2008 financial crisis, um, we've had about a decade to kind of like try to work at something that could sort of provide solutions for a lot more people, but I don't think that's really happened. So now, as the world tries to deal with COVID-19 and the aftershock, um, is this a chance for us to actually try to make something new? I think it's really just them trying to find a way out. You know, we have exhausted, I think, the, the usual policy toolkit. So the things that have worked in the past, the things that we usually rely on, are no longer giving the same uh, measure, the same amount of success. You know, how, how much further can you cut interest rates to stimulate borrowing, to stimulate spending? Especially when in some places, interest rates are already at a negative rate. Yeah. You know, where, you, you're, you're, where the banks or sort of like um, lenders are paying you to, to borrow rather than the other way around. I think there is a bit of hope in the air. You know, I, I feel like, you know, like, what we're doing is just trying to look for some of these answers through just trying to think about what's been missing over the past few years at least. Um, I mean, to borrow a line from Thatcher, maybe there could be an alternative. Um, and that's what I, I'm hopeful for. Like, neoliberalism has shown that it's got a lot of flaws. And I think if we stick to that model going forward, I don't think it will serve the people that need did the most. That's all for this week's Gen Me. Thank you everyone for watching. And thanks to all the people who we spoke to for sharing their thoughts and experiences. We'd like to hear your comments, so please leave them below. Or reach out to us wherever you get your Gen Me on any of the social networks that we're on. And you're on. Another world is possible. Namaste. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>